let's think about another example. Let's say you're interested in learning the position of registered voters on uh, the, upcoming, the, the, the upcoming ballot issue, issue number two, uh, here in Ohio. So you're teaming up with researchers at several other universities across the state. And so ideally, let's say you have access to a good cross-section of different geographic areas, socioeconomic status, uh, employment, and, and some of these different types of things. Okay. In this situation, simple random sampling would be generating a list of all the over 8 million registered voters in Ohio. Okay, and say you assign each one a number on this list, 1 through 8 million plus. And then you write, uh, say, the different numbers 0 through 9 on slips of paper. Throw them in a hat and draw out seven different slips with replacement to form a seven-digit number. So now you've randomly created uh, a number between 0 or 1 and 8 million something. Okay. And then what you do is you look at your list, you figure out who the person is that corresponds to that specific number, and then you contact that person. Okay. And then you do the same thing again. Or, of course, you could use a computer or some other sort of random number generator. The point being that you're random, truly randomly generating the numbers uh, and then using the people on the list that correspond to that index number and contacting them. So in this case, you have the entire list of, of people to which you have access, and you're randomly generating which ones to contact out of that. Another method is what would be called matched random sampling. Now, you would use this method in particular if you think that there's a key variable that might have some sort of effect on what you're doing. Okay, so, so let's think about, uh, again, this issue two example. So let's say that you're concerned that there might be a framing effect that may influence participant responses. Okay, so what you do is you actually then create two different forms of your survey. Okay, so you might, be, uh, you might think that the, the order in which you ask the questions or the, the, the order in which you give the response options or whether you ask uh, a specific question such as their uh, political affiliation or whether they're registered uh, as a Democrat or independent or Republican um, has an effect on their response. So whatever it might be, you think that there, there might be some effect that you have two different versions of your survey. Now what you still want to do is to create a random sample to take each version of your survey. Okay, but if there's there's something like a, um, a, a employment or socioeconomic status or some of these other demographic variables that might have an effect, then what you want is you want the subsamples that are taking each version of your survey to be approximately equal on these two uh, 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 forms on whatever features it is that you think might have an effect. So in other words, you don't want, for example, all of the rich people or all of the Hispanic people or all of the young people to be taking one form of your survey versus the second form. So in this case what you might do is to first use a simple random sampling procedure to generate a list of say 100 different respondents to your survey that you're going to contact. Once you have those 100 respondents then what you might do is then purposely create two subsets of 50 that are trying to match some of these characteristics such as age, education level, uh, demographic, ethnicity, whatever the case may be, across those two subsets. So you're still initially generating a random sample, but then what you're doing is trying to, in creating two different subsamples, match up some of these features across the two. So that part is not random, but very purposeful. A third method is what's referred to as stratified sampling. Again, if you think that there's a specific variable that's very important to have represented accurately in your sample, then you may want to use stratified sampling. So let's again go back to the, the, the notion of issue two. Let's say that you determine that education level, uh, which we'll call um, no high school degree, high school degree, some college or college graduate, has been an important predictor of voting patterns uh, on issues like issue two in other states. So what you want to do with stratified sampling is you're purposely trying to create proportions of some specific variable in your sample that match those found in the population. So if, for example, I know that of all registered voters, um, there are 30% that are college graduates, then what I want to do is to make sure that I have 30% of my sample being college graduates. Okay, so what you're doing is you're looking at the relative proportions of some important variable okay, in which you're interested and then you're sampling such that you have a specific proportion in your sample that matches that in the population. Now you can still use random sampling once you identify these proportions. So what I'm going to determine is let's say that I want 30% college graduates in my sample. Well now I'm going to look at college graduates and if I have a total of 100 people take my survey, 
I'm going to make sure that there's exactly 30 of these college graduates in my survey, okay, out of, or, or taking my survey out of my 100 people. But then exactly which 30 is still going to be determined using some sort of random process. So at stratified sampling, you're creating specific strata or layers in your survey, such as high school, college, college graduate, so forth and so on. Okay, and then that's what you're going to do. So you determine the proportion of um, a specific group, and then and then determine what the target sample size would be for each group. Another way to go about sampling is what's referred to as cluster sampling. Okay. Now, again, if you're covering a large geographic area, such as the entire state of Ohio, then a lot of times cluster sampling may make sense. Well, what exactly does this involve? Okay. What this involves is, is carving up your, your, your total population, okay, your, your total uh, sampling area, into the, these different regions. Okay. And then what you can do is to randomly sample within each one of these uh, uh, regions. Now, there's other ways to do cluster sampling um, beyond something geographic. Okay, right. But uh, sticking with our example, let's say that what you're going to do is divide Ohio into regions associated with each university. So you might have a university in Northwest Ohio, Northeast Ohio, um, OSU in Central Ohio, uh, Southeast Ohio, and then Miami here in Southwest Ohio. Okay. Then within each region, what you might do is randomly select, say, one county to participate, and then randomly select individuals within each selected county. Okay, so what you're doing is you're clustering all of your participants within one specific, in this case, geographic region for simplicity. Okay, but you're still doing this across um, different regions across the state of Ohio. So in this sense, you're hopefully still obtaining uh, a sample that's somewhat representative. But you're doing it in a method that's much, much easier than, um, say, if this is a survey that you have to give face-to-face, -face, you don't want to have to drive all over the entire state of Ohio. You don't want to have to drive out to some remote region um, just to contact one or two registered voters that happen to come up on your randomly generated number list. What you want to do is to focus all your efforts into one, uh, in this case, geographic region, okay? But do so in a way that's still going to hopefully provide you with a representative sample, okay? That's what's referred to as cluster sampling. Okay. And these methods are also covered uh, in Jackson as well. She gives a little bit more detail in, in, in different examples. Okay. Now those first four methods are, are what are referred to as probability sampling methods. Okay. That means even if it's not specifically random, you can identify the specific probability with which each individual respondent is likely to receive your survey or with, uh, with which each person in your population is likely to become part of your sample. Okay. Now there are other methods that are called non-probability sampling methods as opposed to probability sampling methods where you can't specify that. Okay. The most basic of these is what's referred to as convenience sampling. With convenience sampling, you're doing exactly as the name suggests. You're creating your sample out of the thing that's most convenient for you. Standing up on High Street and handing out a survey or stopping people with your clipboard and asking them about how they feel uh, about issue two would be a, a, a prototypic example of convenience sampling. Okay? You're taking whatever sample it is that you can get. With that, a lot of regard to, obviously, in this case, whether or not it's random, uh, and it also uh, then uh, may end up being non-representative as well. Okay? But convenience sampling really refers to, to any instance uh, uh, such as this. Okay? Um, having a, a specific classroom or um, uh, using a specific class would be another example of convenience sampling. If you have access to um, a specific instructor who's letting you come into their class and hand out their survey. Okay, there's nothing special about that class. There's nothing that might be representative about that class. It's just simply uh, a sample that you have that, that, that's, um, to which you have convenient access. Okay, finally, a another uh, sampling method is what's called quota sampling. Now, this is a little bit better, at least, than convenient sampling. Okay, and you may think about this as the non-probability equivalent of stratified sampling. Now, in this case, you still want to identify specific proportions of different groups that you want participating in your study or taking your survey. So again, you might want 30% college graduates. However, what you're going to then do is to uh, um, generate or find these 30% of your people, these 30 participants, through uh, a non-probability method as opposed to a probability method. Okay. What I mean by that is you still might be standing up on High Street or a shopping mall or somewhere else, right, and using convenience sampling to obtain your respondents. However, what you're going to do is you're going to stop sampling once you meet a certain quota of each different particular group. So if you have the proportions of um, some high school versus high school graduate versus some college versus college graduate, 
and you know what proportions you want of each of these four different groups, then you can identify out of a hundred people how many you want. Then what you do is the first question you might ask somebody when you stop them on high screen, um, what level of education have you obtained? And if they say, well, I'm a college graduate, then you can continue to sample them and they become one of the 30 college graduates you want. But then once you have 30 college graduates, then the next person you ask, what education level have you obtained? If they're a college graduate, you're going to let them go and you're not going to sample that person. Then you'll only sample the remaining three groups until you've hit the quotas or the specified number in those groups as well. So again, you're matching the proportions and therefore quota sampling can be a very representative sample. However, the individual people that are a member of each group okay, that are within your sample have not been obtained randomly or with some sort of probability sampling method, but non-randomly or through non-probability sampling instead. Okay? And that's it. Those are the different sampling methods uh, in which we're interested. You might think about, again, some of the pros versus cons of some of these different methods, and in particular about whether or not uh, they produce random versus non-random, and more importantly, representative versus non-representative samples. And that takes us back again to the broader issue, and just want to close with this point so that you guys um, are clear about what we're doing and why it's important to think about the sampling methods we're using in the first place. Okay. Again, what we want to do is make claims based off of our sample about the population. And so the type of claims that we're making are only as good as our ability to generalize to that broader population or draw an accurate inference based off of our sample. And this comes back to something we talked about before in terms of uh, looking at systematic versus unsystematic error. Okay. Just based off of uh, the sample that we're creating, we can end up with sampling error and sampling bias as well. And in particular, sampling error is going to be the equivalent of unsystematic errors that we talked about before. Okay. Now, what does sampling error mean? Well, we might be using um, a specific method. So say that we're using something like stratified sampling. Okay. And in this case, what we're doing is we're creating uh, a sample that's randomly generated within each strata or within each group. And we're also making sure that we have the correct proportions within our sample that are in the population. Well, even still, because it's randomly generated, okay, then that still could lead to some sort of um, uh, unsystematic bias or some sort of error within exactly the 30 people that end up being selected. If all 30 of these people then happen to be female, okay, we expect there to be um, a proportion of male versus female that's equal to whatever the proportion is in Ohio because we're randomly selecting these people. But if it ends up that due to uh, just the random numbers that have come up, we get all females, okay, or we get all uh, of some specific occupation or occupational type or whatever the case may be. Okay, so we can still end up with some sort of what we would call sampling error in this case, even though we're using what is, uh, what is, is a very sound and a very good method. Okay, now this is going to be unsystematic error. Now sampling by would correspond to what we've called before systematic errors. Okay, if um, we're introducing some sort of bias in the way that we're sampling people. Okay, so if we use something like cluster sampling, we pick a specific county and then we're just um, interviewing or surveying people within that specific county. Okay, now this can end up being a very systematic bias because if everybody in that county um, is uh, a factory worker or if everybody in that county is um, uh, a farmer or if everybody in that county is um, Hispanic or a specific ethnicity or whatever it is, right? Then what we're doing is now we have some very systematic bias in what's going on. So it's not this sort of random bias, oops, we happen to randomly select more of this type of person than another. It's something that, that can lead to very systematic errors, okay? So, and both of those are going to compromise our ability to make valid inferences about the population. So that concludes now the lecture on uh, response biases as well as sampling methods uh, to obtain respondents for your survey. And that's the end of our coverage of the survey method in general. Okay, now again, we're going to explore these topics in more detail through some in-class activities. Okay, but by now, then, you should get a general sense of the survey method, how to deploy it, and the things that you need to know in order to create and deploy and collect data on your own uh, class project surveys as well.